Hello and happy Wednesday. It's hashtag your word Wednesday, your vocabulary word on CNN 10. Follow me at Koi Wire. Put your word, definition, and school and a teacher in the comments section of my most recent post, and we'll choose a winner to work into tomorrow's show. We start today with the latest news on North Korea. According to the U.S. government, Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, plans to travel to Russia to meet President Vladimir Putin for discussions on a potential deal to supply Moscow with weapons for its war on Ukraine. The warning came from the National Security Council, and they said that weapon negotiations between between Russia and North Korea are actively advancing, but we don't have any information on when and exactly where a potential meeting between the leaders might take place. The U.S. and its allies are concerned about the meeting. Specifically, the U.S. has increasing concerns over that with which North Korea could supply Russia in terms of military assistance for Russia's war effort in Ukraine. And experts are also concerned that in return, Russia could supply North Korea with technology that could be dangerous, specifically technology that could advance North Korea's satellite and nuclear-powered submarine capabilities. Just last month, North Korea made a second attempt to launch a spy satellite into orbit, though it failed. The Biden administration has routinely declassified intelligence about support that Russia is receiving or is planning to receive in an effort to deter countries from providing support for their war effort. We'll head to Seoul, South Korea now to hear from CNN international correspondent Paula Hancox. The first and last meeting between the current leaders of Russia and North Korea was more than four years ago. Since then, Russian President Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine and his military efforts are faltering. So for Kim Jong-un, the power dynamics have changed. A large power is now dependent on him. That hasn't happened in a while. Um, the second thing he gains is the possibility of access to more oil. At the moment that Kim Jong-un is testing his ballistic missiles, particularly the long-range ones, many of which have design commonalities with Russian missiles, he can get a lot help of help there. U.S. officials believe Moscow could receive multiple types of munitions from Pyongyang in any arms deal, which could be used on the front lines in Ukraine. The Biden administration believes North Korea already delivered infantry rockets and missiles for use by Russian mercenary force Wagner late last year. U.S. officials assess Kim Jong-un may travel to Russia to meet Vladimir Putin this month. There is an Eastern Economic Forum in Vladivostok next week. Letters of support have been exchanged between the two leaders. Russia's defense minister, Sergei Shuigu, was given the red carpet treatment by Kim in Pyongyang in July. The North's military capabilities were on full display. And South Korea's intelligence agency says a second Russian delegation visited. At the start of August, by August 8th, a Russian plane is believed to have transferred unknown military supplies from Pyongyang, no evidence or destination given. Pyongyang and Moscow deny any potential arms deal. Kim is becoming more paranoid than normal over the last four or five years. And so for him, this alliance achieves, makes him look less isolated. It provides a psychological boost for him and his inner circle. Politically, both Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un stand to benefit greatly from a closer alliance. They are united by a common enemy, the United States, and they both want an alternative world order, a world where the U.S. is less powerful and where U.N. Security Council resolutions are less able to be imposed. Paula Hancock, CNN Seoul. We've got new info that says pesky invasive species are causing a whopping $423 billion in damage every year in this world. An invasive species is defined as one that causes economic or environmental harm in an environment to which it is not native. And a new UN report says that human movement like travel or global trade is spreading these animals, plants, and other organisms in new regions at an unprecedented rate. The report says these alien troublemaker species are driving plant and animal extinctions, contributing to food scarcity and making environmental disasters worse all around the planet. And get this, we're discovering about 200 new alien species every year. And out of the 37,000 alien species that have been introduced all over the world, a whopping 3,500 of them are causing serious problems. They're ruining crops, wiping out native species in certain areas, polluting our water, and spreading disease. 
It's hitting our wallets hard too. Scientists are saying the associated economic costs have been skyrocketing, at least quadrupling every 10 years since 1970. The study hopes these findings will lead to more ideas and cooperation for prevention in the future. 10 second trivia. In tennis, what term is used to describe a score of zero? Deuce, nil, love, or let's? Show me some love with some hard hands if you said love. Historians don't exactly know why, but love is the word used in tennis to denote no score. The US Open is underway in New York City. Dating back to 1987, it's the fourth and final major or Grand Slam tennis tournament held each year. The others are the Australian Open, French Open, and Wimbledon. Well, if you have cat-like quickness and golden retriever-like chasing skills, you might find yourself on the court with the biggest tennis stars in the world. CNN's very own John Sarlin has more. Tennis balls. For two weeks of the year, they're inescapable in Queens, New York, on the grounds of the U.S. Open. But who collects all those balls? The stoic and hard-running ball crew members chasing them down with the best standing view in the house. We decide to find out what it takes to become a member of the U.S. Open ball crew from T.N. Noble, the head trainer. What makes a good ball crew member? So it's agility, definitely. We want to be fast out to that ball and get back. Um, we're attentive because we're obviously servicing the world's best tennis players. We want to have fast, flat, and accurate roles, and then teamwork. I know there is this kind of intense tryout for the ball crew members. Would you be able to show me yeah, absolutely. We what can that get would out. Entail. Yeah, we can get out on court. So I'm going to bring Rachel in. She's okay. going to help. She's part of the ball crew. Hey, Rachel. Hello. Is it hard? It can be difficult, but it's a lot of fun. There are three things every crew member needs to master. Retrieving the ball, rolling the ball, and servicing the ball back to the player. First up, retrieving the ball. You ready? OK. Your responsibility is any ball that is hit into the net, run as fast as you can, pick up the ball with two hands, and then return to your ready position. Second one coming. The trickiest part, figuring out where to run after grabbing the ball. Back, 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 back. back. <laughs> Usually if it's before the central line, you're going to run back. But then if it's past that central line, you're going to keep going. Go all the way across. Oh, oh. It was tough. Next, rolling the ball without bouncing it. Instead of doing same foot, same arm, do opposite so you can get down low. That's it. Would you say the roll is the hardest part? Yeah, I think so, because a lot of time your adrenaline is pumping, and then you still have to have a very accurate roll. And remember, low to the ground, low to the ground. Nope. Opposite, uh, opposite, opposite. opposite. Oh. Have you ever rolled in the blue? Occasionally by accident. And finally, servicing the ball back to the players, which not only requires ball skills, but some mind reading, it seems. Go up as if you've got a player right there ready to serve it. And you're going to send them two, maybe three, maybe four. And do they say that? It's all like nonverbal cues. <laughs> whether it's a head nod, whether it's a racket little movement. And you want it just to be a nice toss so it's coming up around their waist height. You don't want too much air on it. So maybe like a... Not as forceful. <laughs> <laughs> There's an argument. <laughs> there is. Is that the kind of toss? That's the kind of toss. They'll typically tap back, so you have to be attentive, grab those two, then go back into position. So you put me through the ringer. Yep. I got to ask you, how'd I do? You did all right. There's a few things you can probably like learn and maybe come back next year. Better like next year. Yes, come back next year. I'll take that. The most dominant competitive eater in the world has tasted defeat. Joey Chestnut goes down at the U.S. Chicken Wing Eating Championship on Sunday. Australian James Webb setting a new world record at Highmark Stadium in Orchard Park, New York. He devoured 276 wings in just 12 minutes. That's about 23 each minute. Chestnut ate 36 fewer wings than Webb, but Joey Jaw says he'll be back next year hungry for revenge. Orchard Park, New York. That's where the Buffalo Bills play, where I played six of my nine NFL seasons and where I learned to chow down on some Buffalo wings, something fierce. So if any of you want to challenge me, I say wing it on, baby. Special shout out today goes to Diamond High School in Anchorage, Alaska. Rise up. Thank you for subscribing and commenting on our YouTube page. I'm Coy Wire, and I'll see you tomorrow.